What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another edition of the O Show podcast, episode 424, presented by Mayweather Boxing and Fitness in Scottsdale, Arizona. Mayweather Boxing and Fitness opening up at the end of the month. You got about two more weeks to sign up for your membership. Learn from the champ, Floyd Money Mayweather himself, Mayweather Boxing and Fitness. Also want to give a shout out to Mayweather Boxing and Fitness out in Las Vegas, Nevada, Spring Valley. Going to be doing some collaborations with them soon as well as Mayweather Boxing and fitness in north brunswick new jersey uh again all coming your way very shortly we're also presented by betonline.ag uh, mlb playoffs taking place the boston red sox just advanced to the american league championship series with a walk-off win over the tampa bay rays last night sign up for that 50 percent bonus betonline.ag on all sports it is an early morning fiasco today we got uh probably one of the more inspiring guests we're gonna have on the show today. He's live via satellite from Atlanta, Georgia. We're here in Phoenix, Mr. Zion Clark. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. So you are all over the place because you're from San. You live in San Diego, right? Yeah, I'm from Ohio, but I'm, I live in San Diego. So I heard that you again go to a dream because you're again you're a wrestler. You do all of this stuff. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you do it. You went to a gym with uh, Anderson Silva, Tyron Woodley, Chuck Liddell, or train at the same gym, correct? Yeah, Team Body Shop under um, head coach Antonio McKee. I don't know if you've uh, heard recent news, but his son AJ, my boy AJ the Mercenary, uh, just was crowned the king of the world in Bellator. Wow! Uh, won a million dollar fight tournament and ended the final fight, the, the finals and uh, the championship fight with a knockout like none other it was awesome those are exciting moments especially when they land it and you you knowing the guy too that's insane that's that's yeah. awesome and it feels good to know that like you helped him get there you know yeah uh, and i heard in an interview too correct me if i'm wrong because it's kind of a hot take especially in today's world you're not a big fan of the ufc um i'm not <laughs> yeah just uh just from being around a lot of these Bellator guys and my coaches, um, I don't want to start any beef or anything. But, you know, I just feel like Bellator really takes care of their athletes a lot uh, more than the UFC does when it comes to, like, if you do good, you get paid your weight, you yeah. get the respect that you worked super hard for, as in I feel like the UFC is more of a bit like big names, get big pay, and... You know how it goes. Oh, 100. I mean, that's the same with any huge promotion, I feel like. You look at the wrestling side, too, with WWE. There's a lot of guys on their way out because they feel disrespected. It's like, okay, if you're a big-name draw, like, you're getting the big paycheck. You're getting the big match. Exactly. So I, I feel like, and again, you, you know, above anybody else, like, know and appreciate discipline, hard work, you know, your whole mantra, no excuses. You are the CEO, let's say, of your own life. So at, at what point, there's, there it is, no fears, no limits, no excuses. Uh, you know, with, with your childhood, everything that you went through, um, you know, starting all the way back from day one, when, when did that kind of click for you, that mentality, uh, going through everything that you went through growing up? Uh, so I actually didn't click until I was about a senior in high school. Wow. Um, Excuse me. Uh, I was um, wrestling at this giant tournament called the J.C. Gorman. And it was one of those tournaments where, like, I really got to test my skill after just years of training, after really working hard and just starting for the first time as a senior in high school. Uh, and wow. this tournament had, like, returning state champions and state placers, like, in every bracket, every weight class. And, uh, you know, I w- it wasn't looking like I was going to do well at all. If anything, I was more so predicted to go 0 and 2 and sit out for the rest of the two days of, of the tournament. Surprise, surprise! I won my first match, won my second match, and then lost my quarterfinal, and then came back to wrestle for third place. Little did I know that by the end of the tournament, I had knocked off four or five guys that I, like went to the state tournament, and I beat them like it was nobody's business. And that one match where it was. I was either going to place or I wasn't going to place. Um, it was going into overtime, and I was just tired. I had tore a muscle in my shoulder. Um, I had just messed up my fingers. It was hard to walk. I was just kind of really beat up, and I was starting to feel down. And my coach grabbed me by the front of my singlet and was like, you're almost there. You're not going to make any excuses. 
you're not gonna fold, you're not gonna fail, because you about to go out there and you're gonna win. And that really stuck with me. And I stuck, dude, this dude, this kid tried to jump over me, like midair. And I caught him by his legs in the air and then rolled and caught him with a double leg and then won the match in the most spectacular fashion ever. And then that, that alone has got to build confidence. But again, that one thing, whether it's one person, whether it's your coach, I know your mother was a huge inspiration too. Like mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter. Like all it takes is that one moment to kind of change everything for you. Cause you know, I've read and, and listened to some of your interviews talking about how as early as five, six years ago, you know, you would consider yourself the quietest guy in the room, you know, dealing with, you know, certain, you know, enraged issues, you know, like you just felt enraged mm -hmm. all the time. In the last five, six years, you know, on that subject, how did that change specifically? Uh, you know, I was able to get my, my own family setting, a good, a stable background, a good, you know, just stable family, which I never had before up until I was about 17. And uh, it's crazy because I'm only 24 now, so it has not been very long at all. Uh, and with my mom just teaching me the way she taught me and really just raised me up to be a respectable, respectable young man and just taught me how to live and survive on my own, really kind of pushed me to that next level where I needed to be. And, um, you know, after I graduated high school, I decided to make that move on my own. And I felt like I was pretty prepared just by her teachings, even though she only taught me for a couple of years, it's all I needed because she really put a lot of effort and a lot of time and her heart and soul into it. How um, much would you say that growing up, whether it would be, you know, in foster care, dealing with not just different people, but growing up around, you know, a different diverse of people all the time, like how much do you think that kind of shaped your mentality? Or was it specifically just like when you were a senior in high school, that's when it really all clicked? Uh, well, when I was coming up, I had a really bad outlook at the world, you know, what I knew first, thing, first things first, what I knew was that everybody's bad, everybody's not a good person, everybody's going to lie to you, everybody's, nobody wants you around, nobody yeah. wants you in their home. And um, that's just kind of what I, what I thought, and I would try to just like go to school and go to wrestling practice every day and stay there as long as possible, because nine times out of ten I would be terrified to go home. And, uh, you know, this was that was no way to live. You know what I mean? And I think it shaped me for the better. Um, now that I'm looking back on it now, uh, just for the fact that, just from my experiences of knowing how bad people can get, shows on how I could treat people to show them how good people can be. What specific things, whether it be. I don't know, like getting picked on or just, you know, people rubbing you the wrong way. How, how much did that kind of d have a say in developing that mentality? Because again, like it's oh, very man. easy so, to like get rubbed yes. the wrong way. So with, with my life, it was like, I got bullied a lot. Uh, you know, I would get picked on, but then at home, you know, I would get beaten. I would be starved. Sometimes I wouldn't eat for a couple of days. And sometimes I would just like, be given a glass of water and half a slice of bread and that would be my meal for the whole day wow and uh you know on top of that i might be locked in a room or you know i just might get in trouble for no reason and have to do everybody else's responsibilities uh especially when you're in a house of eight kid, eight nine kids and you're doing all of their chores just because that's what the parents said that you have to do while they sit and play video games and while they go have fun or they go to the movies or they eat pizza at the table and you got to sit on the floor and eat your food. It, it's just, it's just no way to live. No. I mean, you just feel underappreciated, undervalued. I, I felt less than human. And hey, I mean, getting fed as little as that, like that's going to put you in a bad mood right off the bat because you really have no energy. Exactly. And I was, I was the skinniest, grindiest kid you have ever seen. Like even all the way up until my mom got me. Uh, I, you could see the like you could see my rib cage just by sitting there. I'd had no muscle, no strength, and you know it made life a lot more difficult. It made it easier for people to pick on me at school and then at home. I was just in, just always a big easy target. So how did that all change? Because obviously today you are not a scrawny person, actually fairly jacked. You know, 
Like, was it was it easy? Was it hard? Like when you got into a training regimen and figured out how to do it, was it relatively easy, difficult? Because again, slow metabolisms, fast metabolisms, you had to factor all that in. Yeah, and the thing with me is I have an extremely fast metabolism. Yeah. But what really, like, I'm going to circle back around again, but my mom, you know, when she got me, I had never had so many, like, full meals in my life, you know? Uh, like, big plates of food. She would just keep bringing me plate after plate because she saw that I'd be hungry. And, um, you know, I started just, now that I felt comfortable at home, I could start focusing on the mat, and those were spare three months between my junior and senior year. Um, I went from being that super scrawny kid to just like blew, I blew up, man. I think it was partially like part of a growth spurt. And yeah. on top of that, just, I actually, I was actually getting the nutrients that my body needed. Oh, and it's so important because now you can look back and, you know, still look back at those times and be like, that was very difficult, but I appreciate everything that I went through to get to where mm -hmm. I am today because you wouldn't be here today doing you know, media interviews, you know, having your own documentary, having your own book out, doing all of this stuff. Uh, yeah. When you look back at everything, because a very, very cool story that uh, I heard, because uh, again, like you growing up in, in foster homes, you actually met your real birth mother and got a chance to at very least, you know, connect and, you know, have dialogue with her and, you know, her saying like, oh, I've been looking mm. for you everywhere. And, you know, you, you fired back just saying like, of course, like I'm on TV, I'm doing interviews, I'm doing all this stuff because I made it like I got through all that dirt and rose to the top. When you look at moments like that specifically, does it feel good to interact with people who I don't want to say wronged you growing up, but at the same time did not value you the way that you valued yourself? Um, you know, to me, not really. It's more so that I know what I'm doing and they missed their chances to treat me the way that they should have. And the best revenge is by just living my life the best way I could possibly live it. And, and that's the most healthy way to do it. So what's the uh, specific why? You know, like growing up, being a wrestler, uh, why, why did you choose that? What was the initial itch to get into that? Uh, initially, uh, I, I made friends. You want to be real? I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anybody. And when I walked into that wrestling room, they treated me like I was one of them. They didn't see a disability. They saw a kid that wanted to wrestle. Yeah. And I really respected that. And they really respected me and I respected them. And that's, again, like a very, very important virtue and value to have. Because, again, in that sport specifically, it's not every man for himself, but like you, it, it lives and dies with you, you know? Like your wins and losses die with you, where it's like in baseball, you could – Again, like hit 400 and your team still be 30 games under 500, right? Like it, it yeah. lives or dies with you and your team that you train with that, you know, fuels you nutrition wise and again, nourishes you to get to that point. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, um, my coach will always say this wrestling, it's a single individual sport, but it builds camaraderie like none other. So at uh, what point? Because again, it was senior year when you, you it just clicked for you, you know, just mm -hmm. the, the whole mindset, you know, you as a wrestler, you go to college, like what, what was the first huge victory you think you had where it was like, oh my God, like this, this guy can wrestle. Like, again, like not to say that, you know, people kind of didn't expect it, but when was the moment where it was like, okay, Zion Clark's here? Um, it would have been my first tournament of my senior year of high school. I went, uh, it was called the Dover Invitational. And, you know, wrestling division one in high school is, you know, where it's some of the toughest wrestlers in the state and the country, just being from Ohio in general. And so, you know, every everywhere you go, it's always a battle. So everywhere I went years prior, I would just get my butt kicked. Yeah. Even at this yeah. tournament that we showed up to, and then I showed up to this tournament, and I just go undefeated. That's gotta feel amazing, too. Wow. And the same thing with college, you know. I lost my very first college match. So that's, that's actually the picture of my first college match that I lost. Wow. And then the next day, I go back and take second place at a tournament. Sorry to remind you of that. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's crazy because I remember that feeling I had after that first loss where like, I was just really, really pissed off. And 
you know, I had worked hard to make the starting position as a freshman. I, I was just so upset that my very first home match was a loss in front of the crowd. And I was like, you know, I got to get some redemption. I got to come back even stronger. So I come back and I just tank my way through this tournament into the finals. And then I lose a very close finals match, two to three, uh, against the school Alderson Broadus. Wow. I mean, again, that's what shapes you. But at the same time, like, was that the first big loss that kind of motivated you to do better? Or were there bigger losses throughout your career that you look back on and be like, man, like I screwed up there, but I learned a lot from it? I mean, I never think of a loss as a big loss. Here's the thing, I spent most of my career losing. Mm -hmm. So when I do lose, I just kind of brush it off and keep it moving forward. I just kind of think, okay, so this didn't work. So I'm gonna drill this other move that does work a thousand times. Yeah. And so I just would develop, like, it took years and years, but I would slowly develop my own style to where it got to the point where, like, all right, I step out on the mat, even if the guy knows I'm going to hit a low single or a guy knows I'm going to hit an ankle pick or a guy knows I'm going to hit a headlock, it doesn't matter that he knows the fact that I'm going to hit it anyways because I can, I can do it, you know? Have you gotten to a point yet where people are, again, they see that they're, they're going to wrestle you, they're going to fight you, like, are they intimidated? Is there like a spec, like a factor, like how am I going to adapt? Like how am I going to uh, plan for this in a sense? Absolutely not anymore. Really? You know, I feel like I've really established myself as a martial artist, as a fighter, as a wrestler. And every time I go with anybody now, especially with all these uh, legends I've been training with, these guys really try to knock my head off. And I love it. You know what I mean? Because they go in there, they're, they're probably like, we're not going to treat you any different. If you want to be a fighter like us, you got to work hard like us. So what, what, what's the, like, respect. specific uh, training regimens as well as diet? Because like you said, like, dealing with a fast metabolism, you got to scoff down as much food as you possibly can. And good food, nourishing food, you know? Like, but exactly. at the same time, you need the calories in order to build that muscle. Yeah, so when it comes to just, like, my training regimen, I'm training two, three times a day. I get a lift in and maybe two sessions on the mat. One session would wow. be wrestling, jujitsu, and one would just be uh, striking and uh, grappling. And some days it would be a mixture of everything. Uh, just by the end of the week, you test out how like where we're sitting at. And the cool part about it is, with my skill in wrestling, I've been developing my own fighting style to where I can connect with your face even from the ground, and you still don't see it coming. It's nice. I, I can't. I've only posted one video, but that's all I'm ever gonna post because I want to come out there and be that surprise that nobody expected. See, uh, and but, nobody, nobody thinks about that today. Like, obviously, the big guys promote their stuff. You know, all the content creators put their stuff out there. But, you know, like, if you're a fighter, if, if, if you're a wrestler, if you're doing anything, but in any business, really, you know, like, why mm -hmm. would you give away anything that they could look at film-wise to say, like, okay, like, at very least, we have this on them? Exactly. That's why I won't put it up. I mean, that's insane. Do you um, have specific training programs that you share with other people? You know, like looking forward as, again, you're continuing to inspire millions around the world now. You know, like your name's out there. Like, is there any, like, plans to create programs, do all of this other stuff for other people that want to, you know, not, not be the next Zion Clark, but, you know, follow in your footsteps in wrestling or anything else? Yeah, um, at some point down the road, I definitely will. Uh, as of right now, I'm still perfecting my craft. Um, you know, I can't do too much or then I will lose sight of the main focus, which is making it in the Bellator or one championship or uh, becoming champion wrestler of the world or becoming track and field champion of the world. Those are my main priorities right now. Everything else is a plus, but I'm a, I'm a professional athlete first. See, those are the main priority things, but those are a lot of things to be a priority. So what would be the number one thing? Would it be to... Out of those things? All of them. I feel like I'm very solid in all three all three uh, sports. Wrestling, I've got to work with some of the best wrestlers in the world, even just currently, uh, helping me develop my skill. Fighters, I've worked with a lot of the UFC's most decorated, decorated world champions. Um, what else? Uh, I've just been, I've worked with some of the best coaches around uh, when it comes to striking to really like figure out like, all right, what can I do? What kind of move can I hit? Will this work? Will this, this won't work? 
uh, figuring out just what I can do. And then with track and field, uh, when I'm back in San Diego, I'm about to be at the Olympic Training Center uh, working with their coach and working with uh, their drag work coach, uh, which approached me just at the trials when I competed on uh, national television. And she was like, yo, you need to come out here and throw a jab when we be a monster at it. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll try it. Oh my, and that's such like the best mindset to have too. Cause you know, we talked about earlier, you developing the mentality to say, I can do whatever I want if I put my mind to it. You know, like you going after all of those goals at once, like not everybody can do that. The You know, 99% of people can't do that. You're in the one percentile of people who not only have the mindset to do it, but are actually accomplishing it and kicking ass and actually doing what a lot of people probably think that you couldn't do growing up. Exactly. You know, I don't, I'm not out here to prove myself to anybody. I'm out here to just prove to myself that I can be the best in more than just one thing. And it's not even that. Like, I love wrestling. I grew up fighting for my own life. You know, I, I grew up learning how to survive. So fighting and all that other stuff comes comes naturally. My family is the family I got adopted into. They are a family full of state champions and national champions, whether it was football, wrestling, track and field. Like, I'm not the only state champ either. You know what I mean? And um, it was just I felt like I was surrounded by some great, a great group of people that really said, that, oh, you can be a great just like us, you know. And after watching my older sister win a state title when I was a junior and she was a senior and shattering the state record with a torn MCL, I was like, I definitely got to do this. Wow. You are yeah, who so you hang you around know. with, right? Huh? You are who you hang around with. Exactly. I, at what age did you figure that out? Because again, that's, that's another lesson I feel like a lot of people don't learn about until like either really early on, like you have an experience and you know, like, all right, I'm disciplined enough to know that this is a bad situation. And then there's people who are in their forties thinking like, oh my God, like I've just wasted my life hanging around the wrong people. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like I have my people, you know, like my the city and where I grew up in, Maslin and Canton, they aren't known to be the cleanest, nicest, high income yeah. cities around. If anything, they're known as some of the most dangerous small cities in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, you know, I have a lot of friends from back where I lived in the ghetto. And, you know, not that those guys might not make all the best right decisions, but they've always had my back and they've always pushed me to be better. And same thing goes with my family. My family's not perfect. My family's not everybody's a top tier role model, but I still look to them for guidance. And that's why I feel like there are times where, you know, I can keep a gangster and I can keep a professional and I keep a cordial. Which kind of goes back to the whole social media thing, you know? Like, don't put any of that stuff out there and nobody has to know. Uh, exactly. Again, like, being around that family, though, you know, like, the discipline was there, you know? Like, everybody's a state champion, like you said. Like, there, there's a specific mentality that goes into that, you know? You're, you're being fed constant, you know, approval in the sense of, like, you want to accomplish that? We know how to do it. You know, like we we have your back. We have your full support. Um, when it comes to you individually, though, you know, developing that again, that quote unquote mindset to say I'm going to accomplish anything I set my heart out to do. Uh, at, at one at what point did you say this is what I'm going to do because this is what I do, as opposed to again, like getting advice from a family member, because it might not always be the advice you're looking for. You know, the exact mm -hmm. insight you're looking for, despite you know loving them, you're they're your family. But at the same time, like okay, like I know that's not the perfect advice. When did you know, like I have to find it from within first before taking uh, advice yeah, from anybody? So it goes uh, towards the end of my senior year after I finished my wrestling season, and it was what really kind of did it for me was joining the track and field team. Mm -hmm. You know, I was really inspired by my sister to do it after watching her win a title and shatter the long jump record um, with an injured leg. Like, I, still, that is crazy to me, man. She was sitting in last place, and then somehow, like, the last person to jump, they were trying to tell her not to compete, and she just shattered the state record. Wow. Yeah, it just, and like, something like, the, you'd have to believe it. You'd have to see it to believe it. But... After that, you know, I just kind of made up in my mind that all the lessons I learned from wrestling, I'm going to put them in the track and field. And I didn't really need anybody to tell me that. I just kind of naturally did it. 
So naturally, I was starting to work hard. And with my with my um, predicament in track and field, I only had two months to get high enough in the rankings and win enough races to make it to the state tournament, state track meet. And believe it or not, by the time it was that time, I was number one in the state for shot put, number one in the state for the 800 meter, number one in the state for the 400 meter, number one in the state for the 100 meter, all my events. I was that top dog with only two months of training going into the meet. And uh, after that, you know, I ended up becoming a two-time state champ, four-time placer, uh, junior national champ, uh, just a whole a whole bunch of things just started kind of coming together. Then I was like, okay, I'm, I think I, I think I know what I'm good at, you know? Yeah, and, and, the, and there's like that adversity curve too, where mm-hmm. you know, like it's not just you know the physical attributions that you're putting in; it's the mental stuff, you know, getting over what anybody might say, what anybody might be thinking. Because again, like that, that's kind of a driving point. But like you said before, it's like it's what you want to do, and that's why you do it. You know, it's not to exactly. prove anything to anybody. It's because you love to do it, and that's what you set your heart out to do. But at the exactly. same time, the crazy, oh my bad, you go ahead. I said the crazy part about that time was, I had made so much progress in the shortest amount of time that anybody's ever seen in the state. Yeah. To the point where like they weren't letting me trying to let me compete because they thought I was on some sort of steroids. Mm. And this whole big thing, like my mom had to really step up and stand up for me and my whole family got behind it. They're like, no, this kid just works hard. So I was like, I'm at the school every day, all day. And I'm the first one at the track practice. I'm the last one to leave. Like I would stay hours after the practice was over pulling a tire in my racing chair for a mile, two miles every day after practice. Just working harder than anybody else. Exactly. Just to, just to prove that. And again, like to go back to the adversity thing, like there's, you know, people telling you you can't do it, proving them wrong. Again, it's not the reason, but you know, you're proving them wrong. And at the same time, people are still looking at excuses as to why you're achieving great things. I, I, I also read that you, um, were disrespected by someone in school and he actually spit on them and the principal approved it. Oh, no, he did not approve it. He didn't? I didn't spit on them. They spit on me. Oh. And I knocked them out. That's different. <laughs> in the middle of class. <laughs> now that I think about it, you know, it was like six years ago, but oh my gosh, dude, I was in my English class and at this point, I had never gotten into a fight in school, especially in high school, yeah. because there was just so much other stuff going on for me. And I was like that really, like, just, I was really relaxed and just calm, try to get my stuff done so I could go hang out before practice with my teammates. Like, I was really, like, that chill dude. And this this cat, I'm not going to say names, but came in hollering and, like, spit, and it, like, it hit my desk like right like if it would have went any further would have hit me in the chest uh. and i was just like i took that as the highest form of disrespect and before like he could stand up i already i was already on top of the desk and i already punched him in the mouth and he was already asleep and then i looked at the teacher and i was like you know what i'm gonna just take myself to the office <laughs> and then i texted my mom i said mom i'm probably about to get suspended <laughs> But you stood up for yourself, rightfully so. I did so. stand up for myself. And the crazy part about it was the principal told me, like, if, if anybody would have done that to him in public, he probably would have knocked him out, too. But okay, like, yeah. Since it's, it's on school grounds. He has to suspend me for a few days. I might not get to go to homecoming. I was like, dude, you got to let me go to homecoming. I'm a senior. So he's like, I let you go, but you can't tell anybody that I cleared you to go because you got suspended. I was like, okay. Like, you know, like, and plus, like, the principal, him, him like, him being a fighter and a wrestler himself um, and being a very successful fighter and wrestler himself, um, I felt like he could, he really understood where I was coming from. Yeah. You I mean, know, cause yeah. it's like, I wasn't that dude just senseless, senselessly punch people in school, you know? No, no. I mean, you he know, knew like he had was, to do his I job, but the nicer people there. Oh yeah. And like he had to do his job, but at the same time, he's like, I, I would have done the same thing if I were you. Kudos, yeah. almost. You know, sometimes you get pushed into a corner where there's nothing else to do but fire back. Do you know why he spit on you specifically? Uh, we were arguing about this thing, and I was just talking to him like, bro, why are you just, why are you hogging the one paper that we're all trying to share? And so like, he just, it, it, was, it was so stupid that, honestly, if he just would have stopped talking and not spit on me, I probably would have just kept my cool. 
So that kind of goes back to you saying that things made you easily enraged growing up. And yeah, you, you mentioned even it. Then, like, I would tolerate a lot. You know, I have yeah. very thick skin. So when, like, I got mad, there was a reason behind my anger. Yeah, that's, I mean. Even now, like, it takes a lot for, like, you to push someone that pushed me over the edge. Yeah. Because especially now, I'm more dangerous than I've ever been in my life. And I really don't want to get into any, like, real trouble. And everybody knows you're as dangerous as you've ever been, too. Because, you know, it's all yeah, over so the place. People, people try me. People talk that mess. People say they're going to pull up and fight. Like, I've had people, like, I remember I was in Pennsylvania at this event. And somebody drove all the way from Ohio because they found out that I was there. Just to, just to say they wanted to fight me. Little did they know that I had a lot of my belts were guys with me and so like they walked away <laughs> <laughs> the gang wow yeah that's that's got to be very intimidating walking in and being like all right let's go and then you got your entire wolf pack with you of just accomplished mm -hmm. fighters with these hellish resumes it's like yeah ah, forget exactly. about it it's all talk and i remember i was actually with my boy you ever heard of joey black eyes davis oh yeah so he's like that's my best friend right this dude was with me, and this cat came up, and Joey's like, I got to see. And I just, we just looked at him like, like you know how like you give him that straight face? Like, you know, like, you know it's about to go down. If you like, if you, if you walk any closer, oh man. I just looked at Joey, and then the dude walked away, and I looked at him, we both smiled at each other. It's like, we probably wasn't even about to do nothing in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> All talk, man. All talk, I mean, that's basically what it is now. Like, you, when you look at that, now, like if you were to place yourselves back when you were 18, 17 years old and a kid, you know, spits your way, you know, derogatory thing to do, insanely disrespectful in any regard. Do you look at that now and would you have just sat back and been like, OK, like he's he's got his own issues. He's insecure about something as opposed to now, because you did touch on uh, before how, you know, your faith has grown over the past few years it as has, well. It has. But at the same time, I still am a fighter. Yeah. First. I'm from the streets first, you know, I, I like, I don't tolerate disrespect. Even my mama, dude, my mom is one of the most religious women that I've ever known, or I feel like I will ever meet. But at the same time, she knows how to flip the switch just like that, especially if it's like protecting her family or protecting herself. Like she really knows how to turn it on and off. And don't get me wrong, my mom is an amazing woman. She takes, like, even now, she's constantly bringing in different foster kids and helping wow. them grow and taking care of them. Uh, but, you know, my family, we're kind of gangsters. So, like, we do what we do, and we try to be nice. We inspire people, and we lift people up. But at the same time, you get on our bad side, we can either be your best friend or your worst friend. I mean, that's the fighter mentality. Everybody has a dark side. Yeah. Wow. And that... when I step out into the mat or a ring, I'm nobody's friend, you know? Like, I, my goal is to hurt you in the most painful way possible. Do you have a um, specific dream fight that you'd want? Like, whether it be in Bellator one day or anywhere. Like, do you have a dream opponent? Whether it's wrestling, mixed martial arts, uh, you know, track and field, anything. Wrestling, I want to wrestle Thomas Gilman. Okay. Really bad. Uh, he's a very successful wrestler. I've got, I've got to train with him before. Um, I felt pretty good, you know. We worked with each other for a while. I've, I, I respect the hell out of the dude, mind you. But I would like to really test the medal and see who would get the dub in that match. And then fighting, honestly, I, can't, I don't want to call nobody out before I even step in. Just whoever they send my way, I'm knocking them down. Great mentality to have. I mean, it, it, it's really unbelievable. And then, of course, you got the book out. You got the documentary out on Netflix. Was that all, you know, again, building your team? You know, like, did you want to specifically say, I want to put this out there and spread this specific message, tell my story? Or was it more of, you know, the media side, the publicist side saying, like, let's get this out here? Yeah, absolutely not. I was, I was a dumb kid coming out of high school. <laughs> Didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, it was cool during that senior year of high school throughout the wrestling and track and field where you know i did get followed by espn for almost my entire senior year of high school <laughs> and um that's what's really kind of putting me out there you know being on tv like i'm i'm 18 years old and i'm on the tv in the morning 
sitting at the lunch table and cats like everybody's watching TV and they're looking at me and I'm just like leave me alone because I was still that quiet kid you know but I was just starting to like get used to what I was doing I wasn't used to dude I, I wasn't used to the interviews or nothing like that right like I would be at a wrestling match and I would win or whatever and then like Fox News would come up ask me to talk and I wouldn't I would I would refuse to speak <laughs> it's hard yeah Especially when you know what you're going to say, but you know, like, all these people are watching and all these cameras are just beaming on you. Mm -hmm. Just kind of sitting there blind, and like, yeah. I really wanted to just focus on, like, my craft. Yeah. Which, is, like, and that's the most important my... thing. Huh? Like, that's the most important thing. But, like, once you get really good at it and people start to realize the work that you've put in and how much, how good you are at what you do, everybody wants a slice, right? Whether it be exactly. media, publicists. So then the year after that, I got hit up by this producer. He uh, flew all the way out from New York City, met with me and my mom. Um, and they're like, we want to put a short film together and su submit it into the Sundance Film Festival. And, you know, I'd never heard of it. They were telling me it's like the second biggest film festival on the planet. It's like huge. Like you see people like Kanye, Kim Kardashian, Michael Bay, like, like just like some of the world's top celebrities, artists, producers, the heads of like Netflix, Hulu, HBO, like Amazon, just everybody who is anybody is there. And, you know, they submitted it and we flew out to Salt Lake City. Next thing you know, I won best doc, best short documentary at the Sundance Film Festival and then wow. continued to win almost that almost number one best short documentary at all the film festivals across the planet. And then boom, Netflix is knocking on the door wanting to pick it up. Wow, that, that's, that's something that a lot of film kids wish that they, you know, accomplish one day, you know? And, yeah, and, and, and you're... crazy that whole time I was just in college, just working. Like I did it, went back to school. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. That is such a flex, dude. That that that's awesome. And when it comes to the book too, like you're not like a writer or anything. Like that was like your your story being told and here it is unmatched, you know, you know, setting setting the bar, you know, being the controller, the ruler of your own decisions at all times, regardless of what's happening. What um kind of inspired the book? What do you kind of talk about and you know, just to kind of give you the floor for a second for unmatched, you know, Zion Clark what what's the message that you're trying to spread in this book who are you looking to inspire so this book is actually one of three books i'm going to be releasing i just finished the second one uh, about a couple weeks ago we've been working on this about almost two years wow uh, the first wow. and the second book and um with this first book it's more of a picture expose and it's um it's more like you're gonna you would see this book more in like the children's section in stores and in schools and um like like elementary schools preschools middle schools and my main goal was to target the kids first you know because think about it you can you could be inspiring the next astronaut the next president the next master martial artist the next great anything you know and i just felt like yeah it's cool talking to adults and it's cool talking to businesses and it's cool doing all that stuff, but the joy I would get out of talking to kids is unmatched. And I said that so many times, I had to put it on the name of, put it on the cover of the book. Um, but seriously though, like just the purity of a kid and just how innocent they are and just how just oblivious to the rest of the world that they are is just perfect because if molded the right way, you could really shape their lives into something great. And, and at a young age, like given that the, it's like their formative years, right? Like they're exactly. the first it's thing that you actually came, read into them. It's like, oh, wow. When was the first time someone ever walked up to you and was just like, you know, Mr. Clark, you know, I'm a huge fan. I love what you're doing. You're inspiring me to do this, that, that. And like, how much did that, you know, catapult you into wanting to do more stuff like this? Oh, honestly, it started when I was still in high school. <laughs> Jeez. You were a like, stud in high school, man. Yeah, man. I was on national television as a, as, at 18 years old. Oh, and um, you remember I was on uh, ESPN's Top 10, and they put me on number one in front of LeBron, and that was probably one of the biggest flexes I had at that time. It was like, I was like, yo, 
Bronny, I'm sorry, but I got you beat on this one. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, though, like people ever since I was a senior, they saw me like grow. So a lot of people in my city who saw me like grow up and saw me excel and then become like one of the best dudes in the respective sport in track and field. I mean, I ended my senior year as one of the fastest guys on the Eastern Seaboard and the fastest guy in Ohio. You know what I mean? And uh, people just really just started coming up and like they want to shake my hand and talk a little bit. And I was still that kid that did not like to talk. So right. I would be weirded out almost every time. And I just so I'll keep it very brief and just be like, yeah, nice to meet you. I'm glad that I can make your day. And then I would just keep it moving. And as I got older and as I started really like dive into my skill as an as an athlete, uh, people started, you know, following my pages and and you know, just everything really took off. But at the even at that time, I just ignored all of it. You yeah. know, because I had I had stuff to do. I got stuff to do, you know. So how even I, now, like, Yeah, I, I mean I, like how did you more you know determine to value it or you know, kind of balance it now? Because again, you're doing all of this, you know, media stuff at the same time with your main goal of being an athlete first. Yeah, um, even now, like every every state that I travel to, I find a UFC fighter, a Bellator fighter, a high class wrestler. It doesn't matter where I go, I find them, and either they see that I'm out there and they hit me up, or I hit them up and they're just like, yeah, pull on through. I'd love to work with you. And it's, and it's making it more credible. Uh oh. You there? Oh, well, I'm here. I, but it said it makes it more credible when you're training with people like Platinum Mike Perry, yeah. Anderson Silva, Rampage Jackson. You know what I mean? Like it's it makes you it makes you very credible, uh, especially when those guys go out and speak out and be like, "Holy shit, this dude Zion's the real the real effing deal." You're you know? building those partnerships too. Like you're basically taking your business wherever you are. Like, are you exactly. meeting with anybody this week in Atlanta while you're doing your stuff? Yeah, I'm actually uh, gonna hit up this gym. I can't remember the n name of the top of my head, but they have like two UFC champs and a Bellator champ training there. So I'm about to stop by, just pop in, say what's up, and set up a plan for the next five days while I'm out here. See, like, again, like for people, you like that's such an important lesson to learn, especially as you know, you being 24 years old. I'm 22 years old. You know, just like. Whether you're an athlete, whether you're a podcast host, whether you're in business, music, whatever, you know, like it's so important to realize like wherever you go, make the most of it, make opportunities for yourself. Exactly. Because you, know? you never know what's going to happen, you know, you, you never know who's going to be like, oh my God, that's Zion Clark. Like, oh, like who knew, right? Right, right. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, again, is so inspiring, man, like your entire message, you know, like setting your own limitations. And this will be the last, you know, thing I want to discuss with you. I know you're busy. You got a lot going on. Yeah, actually, don't want to take too much of your time. Oh, perfect timing. Probably there. in the next, like, eight minutes. Oh, then we're in sync then, brother. So the, here, here's what I kind of want to ask you with everything, you know, like when it comes to your mentality, you know, you know, shifting things to your narrative saying I can do whatever I set my mind out to you know whether it be you know a track and field star wanting to be in a, a bellator mixed martial art fighter what is something that you think that you'd want to do moving forward and again like you got a lot on your plate you're probably not thinking so far down the line but at, at the same time you got a plan what's something that you think that you'd want to accomplish and go after that some people might think like oh my god really like i wouldn't have never thought of that real estate really yeah, See, I would have never no. thought of that. <laughs> I've actually been working on it for over a year, getting the plan set up. I'm actually about to buy um, a couple, uh, couple spots back home in my hometown, and then completely redo them and start writing them out. It's been like a thing wow. I've been working on with my best friend, one of my best friends, for the last year and a half. You know, we were bored. I was, we were both in Ohio, and we're like, "Hey, dude, you want to like?" start a real estate business and then next thing you know we were actually pretty serious about it and we hit the books got a lot li got licensed for everything we have a whole construction team that we put together um like we're serious why what's the passion behind that i mean i always just me i'm an opportunist yeah so 
with real estate, um, I did a lot of construction and stuff in high school with the career tech programs. I helped like work houses. I know actually, I know how to build a house and wire it and put in plumbing and everything. It's like a skill that you wouldn't expect me to have. Right. You know? um, but like, well, I have that skill. Now. Why not put it to good use, you know? And why not make some good money while I'm at it too? Do you have experience in the sales game? You know, again, like I trying mean, to sell I'm a pretty, house? I'm pretty good at getting people to buy stuff and do what I want for, for the most part. Uh, I feel like I'd be an uh, awesome salesman, especially with, uh, with us running a company real deal out here in San Diego and California in general. I feel that I've got, I've, this was like my time to really test myself on how I'm able to market and how I'm able to really sell myself and what I do. So now that I've figured out that I can really sell it for what I'm doing right now by just showing proof in the pudding, I'm going to just go build these houses up, get pictures up, big Z association housing, man. Like, you know, it's the real, it's the real deal. You got it all mapped out. And then who wouldn't want Zion Clark to be their real estate agent? Right off the bat, I feel like, oh, yeah, I totally trust this guy. He, he knows what I mean, he's I doing. Hope so. You know, I wouldn't send, I wouldn't steer nobody in the wrong way. You know, I've worked with a lot of people. One of my high school teachers, may may he rest in peace, Von Moeller, just passed away about two months ago. And um, that man really taught me everything I need to know about construction. Like I would like help him build stuff after school if I didn't have practice or something. Like I just, I genuinely like to be around him. And he would just constantly teach me things, show me things, got my OSHA license, got like all this stuff, like all these certifications he helped me get. Cause uh, he's like, you never know when you might want to use it, so. Wow, I would have never guessed that, dude. I know, right? Wow. wow. Like people don't understand, like get that, like on top of wrestling everything, like I used to work on houses. I used to lay like bricks all day <laughs> as a job. I used to clean cars, like. I was your regular, regular, regular dude. <laughs> oh my God. Well, you're creating so many opportunities for yourself, not only for what, you know, you're truly passionate about, but you know, you're creating opportunities for yourself, not only yourself to do other projects that you're passionate about, but you're creating opportunities and inspiring other people, which I feel like is going to be the thing that you look back on and say, that's what I'm most proud of. You know, looking back at this, being able to show other people that you can do really whatever the hell you want. There's you and Craig, too. Thanks so much to Craig for uh, setting this up as well. Um, you know, the, the, I think that your message across boards and, you know, Unmatched available now. The documentary's out on Netflix. Uh, I, I just want to say thanks again, man, for taking the time to chat, you know, with a bum like me. Because, you know, you go from the Ellen Show to the O Show. It's kind of like, where are you going? Uh, but it, it, Stop it. Listen, to me, to me, it doesn't matter if I'm on Ellen, Oprah, your show, my pastor's show. It's like, yeah. I always love getting this, like, drop inspiration and motivate people. That's why, like, I wouldn't, I'll never hesitate to speak to a group of kids, even if my schedule is completely busy. I make the time. Well, that, again, I appreciate it, man. Like, that is, again, so kind, so gracious of you to do and everything that you're doing, everything you've experienced and everything that you've learned is just awesome. And it's been great following your journey to this point. Uh, I'll let you go. Cause again, you got big stuff happening today in just a matter of moments. So uh, I'll let you go, That's but good. this was episode 424 with Zion Clark. Again, the book Unmatched available now, as well as his documentary on Netflix. This was the O Show 424. Hank, hit your clothes, man. Ooh.